What's up YouTube? Glad to be back. Another day, another video. With this video, I want to address something that I already addressed in another video, but I want to hit it with a bit with a bit more accuracy and hit it a little harder to bring it to light a little more. Talked about slavery in the Old Testament, made a little more sense of that, and tried to bring that to hear how we understand that now. But today I want to hit on the rape law. And starting off, I just want everybody to know that this is a law that is misused, misappropriated, misunderstood, and used in a horrible way because we don't understand that cultural gap and we do things like I'm just going to talk about right here. This example of scripture is something that predominantly new atheists use when they want to attack the morality of the God of the God of the Old Testament like he's different than what he is today. What they want to do is pull a little, pull a scripture out of his context and say, oh man, look at what God has done. You want to serve this God and look at what he's supposedly allowed. Look at this. What do you, you mean? You're a Christian? Like, why do you believe in any of this? Proof texting, taking a scripture out of its context, out of its literary, historical, biblical context and using it to try to push a narrative. Completely false should never be done. And by Christians too, don't proof text. Use the whole context of scripture, the whole context of the culture that the scripture is set in to bridge it to today. Again, context, context, context. It is incredibly important to understand the cultural implications of the scripture that you're taking when you want to draw a principle from it and to be able to understand why God said this, why it's there, what's going on, so you can better understand how it applies today. Taking things out of context is an incredibly bad thing to do. And we, I can think of a billion of examples, but you guys know what I'm talking about. When someone takes what you said out of context and it gets you in trouble because they don't, they aren't looking at what you said in the context of a conversation or whatever you're talking about. So let's jump right in. First off, we have got to understand what the culture is in this day. What's going on? Why God is working with the Israelites in this way? The Old Testament and the culture that they're in, a male dominated culture that had things like slavery, that had a different bad view of women. Women were seen as less than men. I want you to know first off, that God didn't do that. That is a result of the sin curse that is on this world. We brought that upon ourselves. The culture of that time was dominated by men. God is stepping into this culture and trying to redirect it. Not trying to, he is redirecting it back to the way that he had first established it with Adam and Eve. And he is incrementally working in this system to do that. Remember, the Israelites are just coming out of an Egyptian culture that essentially taught them this. Pharaoh was king, dominant, man dominant. That's the culture that they're coming out of. So they bring that with them. They bring all that junk with them, the slavery, all those different things. They bring that with them as part of their new culture. So God is working them away from that, getting them out of that mindset and getting them to be the people that he wants them to be so they can be his representative in amidst all these other jacked up cultures. Think about the laws that other countries had at this time. The laws that are in the Old Testament, the Old Testament scriptures, the Torah, first five books of the Bible, no other country had things like that. There were laws like, take care of your brother. Make sure the poor have something to eat. Make sure you leave things in the field for others to glean so that the poor can eat something. Make sure that every, uh, I think it was seven years, every single debt is is done, is made, you know, poof, gone. I wish I had that for my student loans. You know what I'm saying? There was laws in here that no other country had. So it had to be ordained and given by God. God raised the morality of these broken people up and continued to raise that morality up, working incrementally. It's kind of like um, someone who is smoking and wants to get off cigarettes. They usually can't quit cold turkey. What do they do? Take a nicotine patch, you know, get the gum. They either they start chewing sunflower seeds to work themselves off of cigarettes. They can't quit cold turkey. It's the same thing God's doing here. These people are jacked up, but God is not going to just turn them away overnight. It's not going to happen. We're, we're, they are people. Doesn't work that way. God knows that. So he's working them incrementally, working in their culture, meeting these people where they are and taking them where he wants to take them. To the morality and the level of what was going on in Adam in uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That's where he wants to take these people. Getting into the text, I'm in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 22 to 29. That's where we're going to hit part of that. Now, the whole pale of scripture here from Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 13 to 29 
talks about sexual purity, talks about violations of that purity. From 13 to 21, we see different violations of, of the purity, of, but where, where we get to the meat, where we want to hit at is from 22 to 29. Now, from 22 to 27, we see certain laws that talk about violations of the sexual purity that God wanted to have between a, a married man and woman. So if a woman, if a man had sex with another man's wife and she you know, and she was complicit in that, they both were stoned. If a young virgin woman was engaged to another man and she had sex with someone and another man comes and he has sex with her, now, the, the the trick is, if the woman didn't scream out, then she was seen as being complicit in what went on and they were both stoned. Now, if a man comes and he takes an engaged woman and takes her out in the field and violates her there, then they were both stoned. If a man takes a woman out into the field and violates her there and she screams out, then the man is stoned and the woman is spared. Now we get to verses where we are in the text where people take this and misuse this thing is in 28 to 29. Now, what are we talking about here? What's going on? I'll read. If a man encounters a young woman, a virgin who is not engaged, takes hold of her and rapes her and they are discovered, the man who raped her is to give the young woman's father 50 shekels and she will become his wife because he violated her. He cannot divorce her as long as he lives. The first thing we do with this is we take and say, oh my goodness, how can God say that a woman who was raped has to has to marry the, her rapist. How can God allow that? Context, context, context. In this culture, if a woman didn't have a husband or her father, she was done. She had no income. She had no way to live. She would have been a peasant out in the streets. She would have either had to go into slavery or be a prostitute to be able to live. A woman in this time had nothing if she didn't have a man to take care of her. Now, in our culture, that is not the case. That's why it's such a big deal for us because we don't have that context. A woman can take care of herself if she needs to in this day. But in this day and time, that was not the case. She had to have a man who was able to take care of her. And the issue here is if she's violated in this way, no, another man wouldn't want her to be to be his, his wife, most likely. And the father, after he dies, what is this woman going to have? She is going to have nothing. So God is saying, all right, you are going to have to marry her to take care of her and give her sustenance so she can live her life. You violated her. This is on you. You have to take care of her because without anything, she will die. She doesn't have a man in her life. Context, context, context. In our culture, again, that is not the case. But in this culture, a woman had to have a man to take care of her. And the whole deal about the 50 shekels, what's going on with that? Context, context, context. Think about this. If I have $10 a day, I barely get a drop of gas in my tank. If I go back 100 years, $10 will fill fill up 10 cars and $10 will fill up, you know, it is, it is no comparison. I had a grandfather used to tell me 25 cents used to fill his car up on, on in, in gas. That is the difference in money, even by a hundred years. So take thousands of years and go back to this time. 50 shekels was an astounding amount of money to pay to somebody. You could work in this day and time for four months and maybe make 30 shekels. Four months of hard labor, make 30 shekels. This this is requiring a payment of fifty, so that's a couple more late, you know, a couple more months of work, and the value of money then compared to now is just it's completely opposite. So it's hard for us to even have the mindset of how much money that would have meant to somebody. 50 shekels. That is a lot of money. So let me ask you this. And this is the way I, I like to look at it. Before I give the example, I truly want to say that I believe rape is an incredibly atrocious act. And I want to be extremely sensitive to those who may be watching this video who may have experienced something so violent and evil and inhumane. The example I'm going to give next will is all it is, is I'm trying to help bring to light where the Old Testament is talking about this issue and then coming to where we are here. Because I believe rapists, once convicted, should be persecuted to the full extent of the law for their atrocity against their own humankind. Disgusting. It truly is. But this example that I give, so take a rapist is convicted. I don't know exactly what laws or, or what exactly happens to them, you know, as far from the legal side. But I say take add on and add on this. They have to pay whoever they raped a whole year 
whatever they made for the entire year, they have to pay that to that woman and then take care of her for the rest of her life. She may not have to see him again. You know, he could be in jail, prison, whatever. But in however long he lives after that, he has to take care of that woman every day of her life. That is kind. Of, that is trying to bridge the gap of what happened in the Old Testament to today. I also want to add that no amount of money could ever be used to repay a woman for some vile atrocity like rape that had maybe had been committed against her. Part of what that money is talking about in the Old Testament is because women were seen as property. That is part of a fallen man's culture. It got had nothing to do with creating this because of sin, but that's part of where that money comes into play. And that's why I'm using that as part of that this example. In no way do I mean that there is a way that a woman can be paid back for what has been happened to her, what was stolen from her. This is a deterrent. This is not God condoning rape. This is saying, all right, if you do this, this is what will happen to you. You will have to take care of that woman for the rest of her life and give up an incredible amount of money in that day and time. Nobody wanted to do that. When they saw this law come down, they didn't want to engage in sexually violating a woman, raping a woman. They didn't want to do that. This was a deterrent. This is not God condoning rape. This is God putting up a wall in front of it. I hope you guys understand where I'm coming at and what I'm saying. God is not condoning rape in this scripture. This scripture was a deterrent. You have got to understand the context of what the scripture is set in and what that means for why this law was given. And I really hope that makes sense. Again, God is not condoning rape in this scripture. He, this is used as a deterrent. It's kind of like saying, you know, if you're going to commit this crime, you get the electric chair type deal. Is it, is it taking, excuse me, is it taking it that far? No, but this was a huge deterrent, not a condoning but a deterrent against sexually violating a woman. And so for anybody else who, who wants to use this scripture to try to challenge the morality of God, please don't. Because you're making yourself look uneducated. You really are. Saying it the nicest way I can. This is not a scripture condoning rape. This is a deterrent against rape. Gotta understand context. Don't proof text. Try to make sure you understand literary context of the Bible, the historical context of the Bible, and the, the context of the entire biblical text before you want to go off and try to proof text something. So please... If this video helps you out, like and subscribe. Tell me if you like the editing that I'm trying to do. Uh, you know, if you don't like the video, let me know. Don't just post that, you know, be a man about it or, you know, woman up, tell me what's going on, what you don't like, what I can do better. And if you don't like my arguments, tell me why. Thank you guys so much. I hope you have a great day.